Okay. Um, I sometimes feel that the ideas I'm trying to get across are almost like a, a sort of set of random numbers, but hopefully there'll be some sort of pattern that will emerge. The, the, the reason I have this slide here on my desktop is not um, a coincidence. Um, I guess some of you know what they are. Who knows what they are? Robert does. You know the one on the left? Okay, okay. Well, um, one on the left is a Citroen, um, it actually is an ID rather than a DS um, from the 1950s, and the one on the right is a Tatra, what, is a V570 or something? V, okay, from the 19, about 1960? Okay. Now, of course, both these cars were designed by engineers um, and in the case of the, well, the shape of the Citroen was designed by a sculptor, Bertoni. I don't know who styled the, the Tatra. Anyway, they, but they were designed definitely without using computers at all in any way. Um, whereas, of course, all modern cars are designed using computers. Um, from a technical point of view, these two cars are much, much more interesting than, than any, any modern car in the sense that they both represent the countries they come from, the roads that they were designed to drive on. Uh, they both introduced all sorts of technical innovations and so on. So I, my feeling is that computers, their contribution to design is, they're quite useful, but it's, it's like the contribution of Twitter to literature, for example. So I, I don't think that computers are necessarily help at all. Um, uh, and of course, some of us actually hate things like, you know, people. Then they, they go mad. BIM is building information modeling, and it's basically sort of spreadsheets for architects. You know, it's, it's sort of, anyway, it's really boring. So um, I'm uh, now going to, well, the first thing I, I think I'll show is I'll show. Um, Now, this is rather on the same topic. Uh, the building on the left is the Sydney Opera House um, by the architect uh, Utzon and the engineers at Overarab and Partners. Um, the guy on the right there is Ronald Jenkins. And uh, I met him and Overarab um, when working on the Mannheim project. So I was very lucky as a young engineer to meet to meet those men. But Ronald Jenkins was very interesting because he was, well, he was an engineer, but he was very much interested in mathematics. And so he spent a tremendous amount of time working on Sydney Opera House, trying to get it to um, stand up as a structure. Um, nowadays, you wouldn't need somebody like Ronald Jenkins to work on a project like that. Uh, you could have a sort of, almost a gorilla, if you like, who's come from anywhere. And that gorilla would use software written by other people. So compu what computers do is they, they enable a uh, spread of expertise, if you like. And I'm sure it's the same in other fields like medicine. Um, uh, it raises all sorts of questions like what do you need to teach doctors in terms of diagnosis when they can use computers to help them. Um, it's very difficult for us as engineers to know how much do you actually need to know about the theory of shell structures, for example, in order to design them? Because what you do is you, you use software, you put the, the geometry into the software, the software gives you lots of pictures with colors on, telling you what the stresses are and so on, and you don't actually really need to know very much at all. You need common sense as, as more than anything. So it's a very, very difficult problem. Um, we also have the relationship between um, models and um, large-scale things. And this does require, in some ways, more expertise to be able to interpret the relationship between a model like this or the sieve um, and the way that something will behave on a larger scale. Um, I mentioned Darcy Thompson um, earlier on growth and form, and he was very interested in scale particular how scale affects the animal and plant kingdom. So for the um, 
um, for the Mannheim project, we, we used a combination of physical models. So this is a model of the multi uh made from perspex strips, and we loaded it with, with nails in the office in Soho. And by using very simple uh, rules of scaling, very much the same way that you have things like Reynolds number in uh, fluid mechanics, you can scale the results in terms of the size of the model, in terms of the material the model is made from, um, and so on. Um, uh, we did also use the computer. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, so we used something like this, CDC 6600. Anybody old enough here to remember? <laughs> Those sorts of computers. And um, of course, a computer like that is much, much less powerful than a mobile phone. Much, much less powerful. Um, okay, so now let's, let's try and um, uh, talk about something a bit more sort of theoretical. So let's go back to this. Now, through, through this, we started talking about the idea of ellipsoids um, and principal curvatures. Um, I don't know whether the, you got the idea of principal curvature. Uh, it is quite a difficult thing to, to understand. Um, curvature, from a mathematical point of view, is a second order tensor, um, and as such, it has the same properties as stress in a material. Uh, you're used to talking about things like scalars, which like density, which have magnitude but no direction. Vectors, which like force or velocity or acceleration, which have a magnitude and a direction. Curvature and stress are second order tensors, which have, uh, if you like, two directions associated with them rather than just one direction. Now, um, the, this, this, in the book from 1870, is essentially produced using the mathematics that we see here, which is the intersection of three families of surface. We've got a whole pile of ellipsoids, which is essentially a shape a bit like this, except it's also been flattened that way as well. A uh, whole pile of those, a bit like a Russian doll in, inside each other. And then we've got the red surfaces, which are hyperboloids of two sheets, and the blue surfaces, which are hyperboloids of one sheet, like a cooling tower that's been a bit deformed. So there's, there's three families of surfaces the red ones, the blue ones, and, and uh, the black ones, and they're all sort of inside each other. And any point in space is determined by the intersection of one surface from each of those families. Uh, in exactly the same way that in, say, 2D, a point here with a certain value of x is determined by the intersection of a straight line there with a certain value of x and a straight line there with a certain value of y. And in 3D, that would be the equivalent of intersecting, of three sets of, of three planes intersecting. So these are what are called curvilinear coordinates, whereas the equivalent in Cartesian coordinates with planes uh, would would be, well, they wouldn't be curvilinear. Now, this all goes back to um, Dupin, uh, who demonstrated that if you have three sets of surfaces like these, which intersect at right angles, then they intersect in the direction of principal curvatures. Uh, of course, in general, if you have three sets of surfaces intersecting, they don't intersect at right angles. Um, in the same way that if you have uh, a system of lines intersecting, then 
in general, they won't cross at 90 degrees, and the, also the space in between them will, will vary. Okay, so um, mathematically, you tend to write things in this form, where um, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 are what are called curvilinear coordinates. Um, the th one of the things that people find confusing about this is the, is the use of superscripts. Um, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 are different parameters. They're not theta to the power 1, theta, to the theta squared, and theta cubed. Um, people get quite annoyed about it. They say, why do you do that? It seems so annoying. But there is a very good reason, and we probably won't have time to discuss that. Anyway, you can go through relatively standard mathematical operations on these coordinates. Um, so here, for example, uh, we're differentiating um, those functions there with respect to theta 1. Uh, and then theta 2, theta 3, and then we do scalar products and stuff like that. So it's all relatively straightforward stuff for somebody who's had a reasonably good mathematical education, who, which some of you, I guess, have had. Okay, so um, now I'm going to, let's see, jump forward a bit. Now, I won't talk about this in detail, except to say that what we have here are a set of a, a duality between the forces that exist in a shell structure. Here's a shell structure. I load it like this. The forces that exist in the shell structure away from where my fingers are. So I load the shell here, and that load goes through the shell down to the desk. In this area here, there's no actual load on the shell, but it is transmitting the load from my hand. So in this area here, you have these relationships between, uh, between R, which is the geometry, and F, which is the force. On this side, and on this side, we have the equations of what's called inextensional deformation, which is the deformation when something bends but doesn't stretch. It's much more difficult to stretch this. It's almost impossible to stretch it, but it's very easy to bend it. So when I do this, there's the lengths on the surface, if I draw length on the surface here, <laughs> it doesn't work. Oh, there we are. If I draw a length on the surface here, when I deform it, those lengths don't change. Okay, so these are the... Um, uh, you've got geometry. Uh, this is actually angular velocity. Um, this is actually rate of change of curvature, things like that. We end up with, the, with various relationships. This is the one that we're most interested in. Del dot t equals naught, which is the equilibrium equation in the tangential direction of, of the surface. Now... The next concept, how are we doing for time? Okay. The next thing, well, we've already mentioned lengths on a surface here. And I'm saying that um, when I bend this, it doesn't, the length doesn't change. One of the most fundamental things in geometry is the, the ability to calculate distances. And here, the distance along the curve is s, and to find an element of distance between this point and this point, we use Pythagoras' theorem. Delta s squared equals delta x squared plus delta y squared. And what we do is we use calculus to shrink the size of the triangle down to an infinitesimal size, and then we, use, we integrate to add up all those little bits of length to find the total length of the curve, which actually, which actually is very, very often quite difficult, so that for an ellipse, you can't integrate the length of the curve without using elliptic integrals. Okay, so in the special theory of relativity, we have um, Pythagoras' theorem appearing 
but it's um, changed a little bit. So, um, firstly, um, well, what we could do here is we could write delta s equals the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared, so write it like that. Um, and the difference is that, um, well, firstly, we've got a z as well as an x and a y, and we've got a delta t here. Now, what's happening here is actually very, very interesting. It's very personal. Um, and the reason I have that picture there is you have to imagine that those students are like you in this room. And what you, have, what you do is you set up your, for yourselves a coordinate system. So you, have, you flash lights at each other, and you have, all have watches, and you set up a time frame where you all agree that the, the time frame for yourselves, and you agree the distance between each other, which you do by, again, flashing lights backwards and forwards. And that time is t here. And s is my time, because I'm, I'm moving about relative to you. And um, what we're talking about here is the separation between two events in space-time. So here's, here's one event. There. And then there's another event there. And we have to agree about the separation between those. Now, you might say that this event and this event took place two meters away from each other. But that's completely meaningless because in the time between those two events, the Earth has been rotating on its axis, has been moving around the sun. So, I mean, there could be hundreds of kilometers between those two events. The, the only meaningful separation between those two events is the time difference on my watch. Because I, I was present at both those two events. Not just the time on my watch, but also how much older I, I got, my biological clock in that time. Now, what people find difficult in the special theory of relativity is the fact that my, the time difference on my watch is different from the time difference that, that you experience. And um, the difference is caused by this bit, because I moved around, whereas you guys didn't move around relative to each other. Here, C is the speed of light. And the thing is that the speed of light is very, very large. And so the difference in time interval between what we saw on my watch and what you see on your clocks would have been impossible to measure. However, if, uh, and this is good for students, if you have a, a room of students who are, say, around 20, and you imagine that one of them went away in a rocket, and they accelerated away from the Earth for five years, so that's five years in terms of the age of the student, uh, and they're accelerating at the acceleration due to gravity. So they would feel completely comfortable in the rocket. They wouldn't feel uh, a big acceleration. They'd be just exactly the same as being in this room. They do that for five years. They turn around um, and they accelerate in the opposite direction for 10 years. And so after five more years, they, they stop. Then they start going back this way. Then they spin around again and then they slow down for another five years, and then they come back to Earth. So that student is now um, 20 years older. They'd be sort of 40-ish. And the, their friends on Earth would be 336 years older. And the reason for that is because at accelerating at the acceleration due to gravity for five years, you, you get to a speed which is um, quite close to the speed of light. Um, quite a few interesting things come out of this equation. Um, this tells us, for example, that if you wanted to travel a distance of 10,000 light years at the speed of light, it would take you no time at all. I mean, zero time, because um, 
uh, light travels along what are called null geodesics. Um, maybe talk about geodesics later. Anyway, so this is the special theory, which is actually quite difficult. And it, it's, it's based on the experimental evidence of the Michelson-Morley experiment, I think it was, which showed that the um, speed of light is the same in all um, reference frames. Um, and um, Einstein was able to explain that by introducing this, this concept of relativity special theory. Now, the general theory was, so the special theory explained why the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. The general theory explains gravity. And what Einstein was able to do is to take the special theory, which is essentially using Cartesian coordinates, with the geometry of curved surfaces to produce the general theory. Now, um, uh, actually, this is still special theory. Uh, how am I doing for time? OK, OK. Right, now, we talked a bit about mechanics in terms of forces and so on in the shells. Um, these are actually the um, equations of conservation of mass and conservation of momentum, which apply in fluid mechanics. And in fact, they apply in solid mechanics as well. Uh, and basically, everything to do with engineering, of mechanical and civil engineering. Conservation of mass is basically about the um, imagining a cube of material uh, a stationary cube and imagine fluid flowing into and out of that cube. So the, the rate of change of density, which is the d rho by dt, uh, depends upon the difference between the amount of fluid going into here and, and out of here. So that's conservation of mass. Conservation of momentum is uh, a bit more tricky. Um, what we have on the right-hand side here all these things are the stresses on the faces of this cube. And the difference between the stresses on, say, this face and the opposite face, and the bottom and the top, and this face and this face, the difference between those stresses produces a resultant force on the, on the material, which causes it to accelerate. Um, the acceleration here, the d by dt, means rate of change of the density times the x component of velocity. So that's part of the acceleration. The other part of the acceleration is actually quite more difficult to explain, and it, and it explains why fluid mechanics is difficult. And that is this, that if you imagine a boat flowing down a river, if the flow is steady, what that means is that at any one point, the fluid velocity is constant. But you might have a river like this, so it gets narrower here, and even though the fluid velocity at this point remains constant, if you go with the fluid from here to here, you speed up. Does that make sense? So at any one point, the fluid velocity remains the same. But if you move with the fluid, you accelerate as you go along here, and then you slow down as you go through there. So there's no, there's no d by dt term there. Things are not varying with time, except your position is varying with time. And because your position is varying with time, then your velocity is varying with time. And that's what gives all these bits here, which is what makes the Navier-Stokes equations difficult to solve. They're the other equations of fluid mechanics. Now, where relativity theory is actually simpler than um, Newtonian mechanics, is that in relativity theory, what, in the special theory, what you do is you combine the conservation of mass and the conservation of momentum into one set of equations, which, which are these ones. And basically what you do is that you combine the stresses and the density times the velocity terms here into one overall quantity, which is called the stress-energy-momentum tensor. And if you want to write this in a rather more elegant way, avoiding all these subscripts and so on, then you write it like this, del dot 
t equals naught, which is exactly the same equation that we, we have here. Now, um, to go from the special theory to the general theory is exactly the same as going from um, geometry on a flat piece of paper to geometry on a curved surface. So that, for example, uh, if I draw the globe, this is the North Pole, this is the equator, And if I go north from the equator, from here, and go, and go to the North Pole, and north from the equator here, I go to the North Pole. So I've got two parallel lines here which actually meet. And as you know, one of Euclid's axioms is that parallel lines don't meet. Parallel straight lines don't meet. Uh, also, if you add up the angles of these triangles, we've got 90 plus 90 plus whatever is here, so it, it doesn't add up to 180 degrees. Now, we can see that these lines are curved because we can see the, the Earth in, th in three dimensions. But if you're a little insect on here, and you, all you could do is sort of crawl around, and you say a straight line is when I don't go left or don't go right, then um, that's a what's called a geodesic. It doesn't deviate to the left or the right. It's the same geodesic that's used in... Um, Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes. Um, anyway, if, you, if the insect crawls in a straight line, starting here, they'll end up there. So that's a sort of difference between geometry on a flat plane, which is Euclidean geometry, to geometry on a curved plane, which is non-Euclidean geometry, although architects use the word, the phrase non-Euclidean non geometry to mean something a bit vaguer. Anyway, so um, we end up with this as being the new expression for how we can calculate lengths on the surface, which replaces this, which is the equivalent of that. Now, these things here, these are the components of what's called the metric tensor, which arises in, in classical differential geometry <coughs> They're called the coefficients of the first fundamental form. And what you do is this. You do some pure maths on all of this. Um, you have something which are called the Christoffel symbols, which are not the components of a tensor, but they're obtained by differentiating the components of the metric tensor. And you differentiate the um, uh, Christoffel symbols um, and you combine them together, you produce the um, Riemann Christoffel tensor, which appears in the geometry of surfaces as the Gaussian curvature, which is well known from the time of Gauss, which was 19th century? I don't know. Anyway, after Diderot and so on. Now, um, so this was all known before Einstein. Einstein knew about this. There's this thing here called the second Bianchi identity, which um, is basically takes this and does some pure maths on it. There's no sort of physical assumptions there. Um, incidentally, this, these form the components of a tensor, even though the Christoffel symbols are not components of a tensor. And the, physically, what that means is that the Christoffel symbols don't have any real physical meaning, but the Riemann Christoffel tensor does have real physical meaning. Okay, so from the Riemann Christoffel tensor, you get the Ricci tensor, and then there's a scalar curvature, and then uh, Einstein took all this stuff to get together and produced the Einstein tensor. And the Einstein tensor tells us that, that this is true. The second Bianchi identity tells us that that is true. And that means 
that uh, we end up with del dot tor equals naught. Um, it's essentially telling us that the conservation of momentum and conservation of energy are essentially a geometric are a consequence of the geometric structure of space-time. Um, and uh, as I said, you have exactly the same equation there in the, the theory of shells. So um, I think that's probably where I'll stop. Is that OK? Well, well yeah, we can have time. Um, okay, okay, well. Okay, right. Well, what I might do then is I might, um, well, th firstly, this, I'll mention this. It's quite interesting. The, the special theory tells us that length and time are essentially the same. Uh, in other words, we don't have three dimensions. We don't have mass, length, and time. We just have two dimensions, mass and length and time. Because length, length and time are the same, and they're related by the speed of light. The, the um, general theory tells us that mass, length, and time are uh, essentially the same thing. Um, and therefore, force is dimensionless in the same way that velocity is dimensionless. Um, uh, and the unit, uh, a, a unit of force is 1.21 times 10 to the 44 newtons. So it's not actually, it's quite big. It's, it's not really much use for um, uh, practical calculations. I suppose in some ways what one of the most interesting things about special theory is that in the special theory, the, uh, your components of velocity in terms of your coordinate system, there are four components. There's the rate of change of your time relative to the rate of change of my time. And then here we've got dx by ds, dy by ds, dz by ds, which the um, rate of change of position with respect to my time. Um, the, in the special theory, the, your velocity is a unit vector. Um, and it, what it means is, is that when I'm standing here, not moving relative to you at all, um, I only, well, I have to move, but <laughs> we, only have, we only have this step here. And that means that we're basically agreeing about the time change. But what it means is that even when I'm not moving, I have a velocity, which is my velocity, and that means that I'm getting older every second, and at some point I'm going to die. So your velocity is something which you sort of carry with you, and it's very, very personal, much more so than in uh, Newtonian mechanics, where velocity is always relative. Yeah. Um, I think what I'll do now is I'll just show you some bits of software running. Um, Now, um, so I showed the picture of the British Museum, and Robert showed a picture of the British Museum. So you, I guess you've got a sort of idea of what, what the geometry is like. Actually, I don't want to do that. I'll do this. Okay. The, um, maybe I should show the picture first. So the geometry of the roof is a rectangle in plan with a circle in the middle for the existing reading room. And um, this is how the geometry was defined. It was defined by those surfaces I, which I showed earlier, which, have, which are defined by mathematical functions, one of which is based on the B.O. Savar law of electricity. Um, and then the, um, the grid 
is um, stretched over the uh, those surfaces like like this, like an, like a sort of elastic fabric. So this this was done. Uh, well, I worked on this this more than twenty years ago. Um, so the engineers, I, I, worked for, I was working on behalf of Bureau Happel then, the engineers. So the engineers defined the geometry of that roof, not the architects. And engineer, um, architects, even though they're quite lazy, are actually not stupid. <laughs> when I say they're lazy, what they tend to do is, if, they, if there's something they don't want to do themselves, they get some other group of people to do it for them. So things like working out the money they have things called quantity surveyors in the UK, and they do, they do all the sums with the money. Um, they get engineers to do all the calculations for the, the structure and the thermal side. Um, but what architects realized was that they can't really get somebody else to do the geometry of their buildings, because if they get somebody else to do the geometry, then they effectively lose complete control over the design process. The person who controls the geometry of a building is the person who controls the design. Because that's, everything comes through geometry. You can't do any structural analysis, you can't do anything without, without geometry. So partly as a result of this project, from partners um, set up their own group under uh, Hugh Whitehead in order to do the geometry of some of the later projects like Beijing Airport, um, like the Sage at Gateshead, and so on. And I think I'll, uh, I could talk quite a lot about the structural behavior of the roof. Uh, uh, maybe I will mention it. I'm okay for time? Okay, so. Sorry? The engineers did the geometry of this roof. But the architects realized that they can't let that happen in the future, because otherwise engineers will take control of the design process. Um, and so that, and that's what I mean when I say that they're not stupid. They realize that actually they have, to, they have to sort of take ownership of this. They can leave somebody else to work out the finances and all the sort of heat loss and all that sort of boring stuff. But the geometry and which, it's the geometry which not only controls the, the building itself, but it controls the way it looks, which is what architecture is, is all about. So, um, now this is a program I wrote to show how the roof will collapse. One of the problems with the roof is that it's only got sliding bearings around the edges. And so it can't push outwards. And it means you have a tremendous concentration of force coming down, down the corners. Partly explains uh, the exact geometry that was chose that we chose for, for the corners. But here you can see it collapsing. Now, of course, another interesting thing from a mathematical point of view with with uh, engineering is is this whole business of collapse. And how you can, well, you can't prove that it won't collapse. All that you can do is to try and convince yourself that it's sufficiently unlikely that you don't need to lie awake at night thinking about it. So, um, in terms of things like probability theory, are Well, you the yes, if you, you put more load on than it was designed for, then at some point, as you increase the load, it, it will collapse. And the same obviously applies to any, any building. The typical factor of safety that are used in buildings is about 1.5. If you increase the loads by a factor of 1.5, then things will collapse. It's relatively small. Um, and from the mathematical point of view, it is a really, really interesting question. Because it's, you, you've essentially got a large number of random variables in terms of material properties and strengths and so on, together with 
uh, all sorts of other uncertainties in terms of the accuracy of the analysis and so on. So it's actually impossible to work out the probability of failure. Although for certain sorts of buildings, people make extra uh, effort, things like nuclear reactors and so on. Uh, well, the, that was an interesting question. Um, the grid shells sometimes have triangular grids and sometimes they have rectangular, rectangular grids. If you have a rectangular grid, then um, that you can deform that rectangle, you can sort of deform it out of the plane, you can squash it this way and so on. So there's all sorts of ways in which a glass panel here can be uh, broken by that frame deforming. On the other hand, if you've got a triangle, then three points define a, a plane. And so in order to deform that triangle, you've actually got to change the length. So it's, it's much, much better to have a triangular grid, if you can, for a grid shell. Except that the more efficient that you make a shell structure, the more sudden the failure. Um, so something like this... <laughs> okay, now this, this I can actually, and I'll take this as well. Um, this, because this is only, this is not triangulated, it's only got members in two directions. So it's actually quite flexible and I can deform it quite a lot before the maximum load is so about there. This, which is fully triangulated, is much stiffer and it just suddenly goes through. Um, and it's called imperfection sensitivity and, and sh proper shells like this are extremely it's in, uh, imperfection sensitive, whereas this is, is not imperfection sensitive. And I'll just finish off with um, showing one more program, which is this. Now, Fryato was very interested in uh, using minimal surfaces to make tent structures and so on. This is a, uh, a minimal surface. Whoops. Um, now, um, you can see this is the, the same, the mathematical model of the picture I showed earlier, which was a soap film with a woolen thread forming this thing, which is called a fryotto eye. Basically, you have to pull upwards on, on that thread. Um, the, because it's a minimal surface, the lines principal curvature on the surface form curvilinear squares, and you can construct it such that the um, uh, distance between these nodes is proportional to the radius of curvature. The equilibrium of the red line here, which is the wool, means that the lines of principal curvature have to come into the boundary at 45 degrees. And the reason for that is that the equilibrium equations of the wool itself means that the curvature of the wool must all be, must all lie in the, in the local plane of the surface. You can't have any normal curvature because there's no force to resist that. And so, uh, the wool is in what's called an asymptotic direction. But the interesting thing here is that, is what happens at the support, uh, because I can lift the support up. Um, so this is running in real time, using the same sort of technique that Daniel uses, dynamic relaxation. Um, I think what's happened now is that the spacing between the lines has got much larger, which means there's actually no curvature at that particular point. If I, if I support, if I move the support down, you see I get a very, very dense grid here because the, uh, well, in both cases, the, the, you need to have 90 degree angle between the asymptotic directions on a mineral surface. And now, 
I've got more than 90 degrees between those two directions. And I think it must, it must mean that actually the spacing of the grid tends to zero at, at that point. So there's actually infinite curvature at that point. Um, uh, if you speak to people who know about differential geometry, they, they sort of try and ex help me understand what's going on. The other thing, of course, is that all this stuff to a minimal surface is very much tied up with the square root of minus one. So if you like doing um, complex maths, this, this is a good place. So this, this is, um, these sorts of questions are nice sort of, well, I, I, questions for uh, mathematicians to, to investigate. Okay, so I think I really ought to stop now, but thank you very much. I got maybe one theoretical question, maybe a stupid one, but are you really sure that uh, with such a complicated and complex structures, do we really save money and do we really save material? Sometimes I've got that feeling that those structures are so complicated and complex that maybe in some point of view it doesn't make sense to make such complicated structures to, to fulfill, I mean, to, to make room for. It's just a basic question, but why well, do you um, put light on it? Yes, so... Um, For instance, here. No, I don't know. This Google Maps is normally much higher resolution. Anyway, when you, when you look on here, what you see is there's some trusses here which are actually outside the roof, which you don't see from the inside. And um, those... Um, Uh, those trusses have got so much force in them that they're actually machined out of solid steel. Now, the reason that we need those is because there's, there's no horizontal restraint from, from the supporting structure. The supporting masonry structure is too weak to, to carry a horizontal load. We suggested to Foster and Partners that they have a series of tension cables inside the roof to resist that, that thrust. Um, and if we had done that, then we would have saved, I don't know, maybe hundreds of tons of steel. Um, so, well, there's two questions. There's firstly the question of the cost and, uh, and the environmental um, cost of, of the extra steel. There's also the cost, there's also the question of honesty in terms of, uh, there's actually a lot of structure there which is not seen, it's, 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 it's hidden. Um, uh, I suppose for a building like this, which hopefully will, will last for a long time, um, uh, it, 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 it's justified to spend the extra, extra money. Um, but architects and engineers all the time are having to make these sorts of, of decisions. Um, and architecture obviously is, is, is more th about much more than just <coughs> the cost and so on. It's about um, creating spaces for, pe for people. There's also all sorts of different discussions about recycling. So that if you recycle structural steel, it's actually relatively efficient 
Um, and, uh, but some people say, well, you ought to use timber because timber is more environmentally friendly and, and so on. But of course, steel is a greatly superior structural material to, to timber. I mean, you don't have to make timber cars anymore. So uh, I think there is no answer to it, really. <laughs> It was all driven by um, no, I can't really see the grid very well there. But it, it was all. What happens is that the, the, the grid lines they, they, they come along here, and then at some point around here they, they diverge and then they start going, going like that. And all, all of that, we're trying to work out what happens here which you can see um, is happening here over the pediment, it was worked out in terms of the maximum glass panel size. We, we, had, we were putting in more triangles to try and stop the glass panels getting bigger than people could actually make at that time. What's quite surprising, though, is that it almost looks as though the grid deliberately sort of mirrors the pediment. Is that, is that the right word for this triangle a bit, pediment? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it almost looks like the grid deliberately follows that, but it doesn't. I mean, it, it, it looks like it, but it's purely an accident based on pretty different criteria in terms of maximum glass size. Yeah, I think I, I think probably um, now um, th this this you can see here this is the Amsterdam Maritime Museum. You can see here that the, 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 the members do radiate out from the corner, um, and that is quite good because it, it does mirror the fact that the forces, the only place that you can push outwards, you can push, yeah, the only place you've got something to push against is at the corner uh, because you can have tension around the edge and you can push into the corner. But it, that, that was also just a coincidence which was based on the um, points of the circle on an old um, Dutch maritime map. Take the points of the compass and you join these with straight lines. Oops. You join all, every point to every other point, which gives you this, this grid. And then you've basically taken part of that grid and you have all these radiating lines from the corner. So that, that again, was just, was just a coincidence. So I would probably try and combine what we learned here um, with what we did on the British Museum 10 years earlier. Um, this project was interesting from a mathematical point of view because it was, we had to solve the same problem that Daniel mentioned in terms of having planar faces. So here we've got a combination of triangles, quadrilaterals, and so on. Um, uh, and there's quite a, there's a interesting relationship between forces and geometry for that as well, which is a bit complex to try and explain now. Um, but it, it, it's a sort of analogy that you can replace the geometrical problem with an equivalent problem in terms of equilibrium in the plane. <laughs>
Yeah. Which is completely different, I would say, than how architects uh, look at it. So it's true, I think, uh, the real architects have difficulty in understanding uh, structural engineers when, when we are discussing a solution uh, like this and doing uh, an experience with, with, with the architects that you are talking about when, when you are uh, designing a, a complex structure like this? Or is it just me? Well, um, There's quite a lot of issues there. Um, firstly, what engineers say to architects and what engineers say to other engineers aren't the same. You need to sort of give the architects a sort of baby talk version, if you like. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that, no, well, no that, that's not really true. What I'm saying is that engineers, when they're talking amongst themselves, are much more interested about collapse and killing a party of 100 school children, okay? And that's, that trumps anything, you know? So your discussions about thermal performance and stuff like that are in simple form, really. What you're really concerned about is, is this thing gonna stand up? And so what you have to have is a conversation with the architect, but, but, but you can't really talk about it with the architects, because the, you know the, you don't really have the vocabulary to to sort of say that you can't say if you say to the architect, well, we're really worried about falling down. The architect will think, oh God, what a wimp! You know, I'll go to some, I'll go to Arab or somebody else, you know, who <laughs> doesn't doesn't come up with these sort of ex existential sort of angst all the time. Um, uh, so it's. But, I mean, it, it, it depends very much. It, 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 everything has to do with personal relationships. So I was very lucky, particularly on the British Museum, in working with Philomena Russo at Foster and Partners, and she was absolutely fantastic to work with. And Andrew Chan at, at Bureau Happold. Um, uh, but I suppose it's probably, I'm probably being a bit melodramatic there, but I suppose what happens is that every, t every conversation you have whether it's with a client or with an architect or whatever, or contractor, it, it, you're always, you, use, you, you have a particular language that you use for that person depending upon what their interests are. Uh, one of the difficulties that one finds as an engineer is that architects are, are very, they, find, they get very embarrassed talking about aesthetics. They, they don't really have the vocabulary to talk about aesthetics. And actually they seem to rely quite a lot on engineering simulations to, to somehow give them the aesthetics. Whereas actually aesthetics are more important in general than the, well, not more important, but what happens is that you can change the shape of a building quite a lot. It doesn't really affect its thermal performance that much. So optimizing it, it doesn't really make that much sense. In fact, by definition, optimization doesn't make all that much sense. In, in the, if you plot a graph of something against something like that, you say, oh, I want to be there, but actually, it doesn't matter. You could be here, and it's still, still pretty much as good, and it might be better in other respects. All that you want to do is to avoid being, being there. So I think architects like to use optimization as, as, a, as a way of, of avoiding having to get involved in aesthetic. Yeah. It, yes, yes, it's, it becomes like, like a, yes, it, it's a way. Yeah, it's a sort of, yeah, it's bullshit, basically, a lot of it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. But now the problem is, is the more you know about anything, the more you realize how complicated it is, and that almost anything you say actually doesn't make sense if you deconstruct it sufficiently. Yes. 
Yes, yes. I mean, I, my, my view is idea, that um, the, the ideal thing is that the, the person who designs the building ought to be the pers same person who writes the code. <laughs> In the same way that tr traditional car tr Japanese carpenters would begin by making their own uh, tools. There's, there's an analogy I use about this sometimes, and that is that a lot of computer software is like a Swiss Army knife. It's designed to do all sorts of things. It's got a pair of scissors on there, it's got a nail file on there, it's got, it's got a blade, it's got a thing for getting stones out of horses' hooves and stuff. But it's hopeless at pretty much all of those things. The ideal th thing is to have something like, say, if you want to cut something, you want to have a scalpel. So you have a tool which is designed specifically for just one application. And that means that you have to write new software for every building that you write. And so uh, rather than getting code from Robert or, or Daniel, then you ought to write your own code specifically just for your building. But the problem there is that, I mean, that's not really very efficient, is it? If you want to write an email to somebody, that you start by writing an email program for yourself. <laughs> So, um, but it, uh, in an ideal world, one, one, would, one would generate your own tools and you wouldn't rely on a whole sort of infrastructure and big business to decide what you do. Because what, what happens, of course, is the tool that you use ha does determine what you design. So you mentioned Katia. Katia is, is basically Dassault systems. It's, it's big business, aerospace, defense related. So it means that you as an architect, or Geary as an architect, their designs are influenced by the large industrial complex. And they, they are controlled by them. Can I just bring in a sort of a slight variation of what you said? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm not actually building a big computer tool. Which yeah. Is like a, and I think it's the plugin that wraps up a lot of um, theoretical ideas mm. in a way exactly as you described it, which reduces, it encapsulates knowledge, it reduces the need for the end user to understand the theory. He, he gets a node that he can put on the calendar that's required to mm. make us energy analysis or anything else. Mm. So Yeah. Into the black box to do something that you can do with it. Yeah. Because there's definitely a specialization of like you and, 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 and Daniel who, who make who make the mm. right tools. But what should the architect and user know about the theory behind the plugin before he becomes uh, kind of a suitable or qualified user? Yeah. Well, I think that's that's part of a much wider question yes. like um, how much do you need to know about um, the second law of thermodynamics before you can drive a car? You know, <laughs> it's, um, uh, I suppose there, through, through the computer, uh, we, we are, rem as users all the time, we are sort of removed more and more from the, from the technology. Um, uh, I mean, it's the same with, with say, cars, so that you know, when we were young, if your car stopped working, then you'd open the bonnet and you'd fiddle around with various bits. You'd change the points or something. Whereas now, you, you are removed from the technology of cars because they're so complicated that, that you can't, that even if you're a garage, you don't repair things. You take stuff out, throw it away and put something in. So we are all the time removed from, from technology. Um, 
but I, I don't know. There, there is no answer to that. I mean, you can't. You can't sort of. I mean, if nothing else, there's the time constraint in working in an office. You can't. You, you, you need to be able to do things quickly. So you then end up not being the Renaissance man, <laughs> but the Renaissance team. You, you end up, or the, yes, I mean, I think it, it's, it's, what happens in geometry is that you end up with all sorts of, I mean, a very common thing in architectural geometry is something like a plane, and you have a curve, which is defined by, say, a series of points. So you have a series of line segments, and, the, and then one of those line segments intersects the plane, you need to find out where this is. So that's that sort of thing. Now that's the sort of thing which I think a young person now would say, oh, I need to do this, and they then get a plug-in from somewhere, which does it. But Robert and I would say, well, oh, well, you know, it's about th three or four lines of code. And, but we know how to do the code, but I don't know how to do, I don't know how to plug-ins, I had no idea how to use plug-ins. Um, and it's the same way that you know, I can remember you couldn't you, you couldn't draw anything in AutoCAD. <laughs> you know all the sort of theory, but you can't you know the practical thing. So there's a generational thing as well that, that young people do things differently. I, I think it's prints mm. where somebody's gone up and they actually done the thousands of lines of code and they can actually draw something that really asks the question, did it actually turn out the way you want? Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that happens in mathematics as well, is yeah. it? I mean, they, they, they use... The same experience with, uh, let's say, mechanical engineers. Yeah. They just buy some, some software and they use it, and they say, okay, there was a result. And mathematicians comes and says, oh, okay, this equation has no solution. Yeah. Oh, how? There is a solution. Yeah, on the computer. This is similar to robot guy. Yeah. It's similar. Yeah. So Yeah. Ask somebody who understands. Yes. What, what should be uh, taught at schools? Yeah. Yes. It's much more uh, complicated. Just to bring a contemporary political dimension to this, we have a contender to be the next prime minister of the UK yes. who will on record as saying he no longer intends to have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. 
we, 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 we do two sorts of calculations, really. One is geometrical calculations in order to make sure everything fits together, that you make all these steel bits and pieces in the factory and then you bring them to site and they all fit together. And that has to be very, very accurate. But if you get it wrong, it's not necessarily the end of the world. The other ones are, are structural calculations where you try and predict what will happen when it snows or it's windy. And those calculations are less accurate, but they're much, much more important. And, and basically, I mean, Wittgenstein said that you can't prove that the sun will rise tomorrow. Okay, so uh, there's, uh, the, the, this, this, the, the question is, is how, how certain you are about various things. And what happens in engineering is that uh, from time to time we have failures and that those en failures enable us to, to reevaluate the way that things are done. Of course, we've had the recent done the thing with Boeing, but of course, in the past, there were other problems. There was the Comet airliner in the British aeroplane, um, various failures of bridges, 9-11. Uh, so every time there is one of these failures, then people sort of reevaluate. Um, I suppose with computers, one of the problems is that there, potentially there are things that could happen with computers which would you know, cause the entire world economy to come to, you know, if you couldn't use a credit card, for example, and you know, <laughs> wouldn't want to buy any food, everything would completely break down. Hospitals would cease to function. So, um, uh, but it, it's, yeah, so plugins are just part, part of that. Um, but I think for me, I think the main problem with plugins is that, is that intellectually they, they diminish the people who use them. They make them into just sort of automata who, who download plugins rather than think about whatever the problem is that they're trying to solve. Or is they're just being lazy, if you like. Yes. I, I, another in interesting issue which is related to that is that if you write some software for somebody else to use, you have to decide how much control you give them over the result. And if you're sensible, you limit tremendously what they can do so that they feel as though they're in control, but you don't give them sufficient control to, to mess things up. It's like giving a toy to a two-year-old that you want something that the two-year-old will be happy with, but they won't, won't do them, won't produce any sort of untoward. So things like color are good. You allow them to change the color of things, but don't change the structural form. But actually, the other <laughs> thing is that you want your users to start thinking about the world in terms of the concepts and terminology that are in the software. It's really important. Yes. I mean, I think, I think you see, in general, I, I write software which I use on projects, and nobody else uses them. Whereas you write software for somebody else to use, which is really, really interesting because you then have to think about what does this person need and what should you give them and what shouldn't you give them, um, which is completely... So you actually have to put yourself in the, in the shoes of the, of the user and you, control, and you have to th control their thought processes. Are they going to they go proper coding? And that's what you design script out because you can go from the diagram yeah. to code and then you can go off to all these little bits and yeah. functions. So you're not trapped in this non immersion mm. of thinking. <laughs> you talk about grasshopper now, are you? Uh because <laughs> 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 the jumping grasshoppers is in charge. Do you understand what we're talking about here? Do you understand what we're talking yeah, yeah, about? Yeah.
Yeah. And you know you woke up and you whispered in my ear, but there's no complete silence. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you.